welcome to Chiba's visiting lecture series. I am Parminder Sashdev, Professor of Neuropsychiatry at the University of New South Wales in Sydney and co-director of the Center for Healthy Brain Aging at the same university. I would firstly like to acknowledge the medical people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which our center is located and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, today we are privileged to host Professor Jakob Stern. Uh, I just call upon Dr. Professor Stern to say his hello to the audience. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. To most of you, Professor Stern needs no introduction. Uh, he is the professor uh, of neuropsychology, the Florence Irving professor in the departments of neurology and psychiatry and the Taub Institute for Research on Alzheimer's disease and the aging brain at Columbia University, New York. So Professor Stern's main research focus is on cognition in normal aging and in diseases of aging, particularly Alzheimer's disease. He's of course best known for his pioneering work on brain and cognitive reserve. And he has in fact become synonymous with this concept. Following the lecture, a live Q&A with Professor Stern will follow. So throughout the talk, please direct all your questions via the Q&A function. You will see the button at the bottom of your screen. So I prefer to use the Q&A button and not the chat button, because that will be followed up. Thank you for every, to everyone for attending from around the world. And now I welcome Professor Jakob Stern with his talk, Update on Cognitive Reserve. Professor Stern. It's my pleasure to give you this talk on reserve and related concepts. The concept of reserve was developed to explain the disjunction, the disjunction between the degree of brain damage that people might suffer uh, and their clinical outcome. So clinicians often note that two people with the same amount of uh, brain damage, whether it be stroke or Alzheimer's pathology, uh, look different clinically. And reserve has been developed to explain this disjunction. I'm going to talk about three different concepts today, brain reserve, brain maintenance, and cognitive reserve. Uh, brain reserve was the earliest concept um, and uh, basically means more neurons or synapses to lose brain maintenance, the direct effect of lifestyle or activities on aging or disease pathology, and cognitive reserve, which is um, resilience or plasticity of cognitive networks in the face of disruption. A brain reserve was the earliest concept that was first suggested uh, in an article by Katzman uh, in 1988. Um, Katzman and Terry and their group were following elderly people in the Bronx, which is a little bit north of our hospital. Um, uh, we were in the Washington Heights in the north of Manhattan, and a little above that is the Bronx. And they wrote an article where they talked about 10 women who were cognitively normal at death, um, but had a large degree of plaque pathology at post-mortem. And they were wondering why these people uh, weren't demented. Um, they were just discovering this correlation between plaque burden, amyloid plaque burden, and cognition. And they speculated that these individuals had larger than average brains. Therefore, they had more large neurons, and thus might be said to have greater reserve. So their idea was that they had more neurons to lose, uh, and they called this um, brain reserve. Um, it's a pretty simple concept. Larger head might be associated with um, uh, the ability to withstand pathology. Here's a very early, early article. Peter Schofield, who's now back in Australia, was a postdoc with us quite a few years ago and was taken with this idea. So he asked the research assistants in our community um, aging project to measure head circumference of all of our subjects. So here you have head circumference from small to large, and then the prevalence, prevalence of AD. And you can see there is this reduced prevalence of Alzheimer's disease uh, with larger head circumference. Uh, and there's a lot of other epidemiology to support this very basic idea. May brain maintenance is really the latest concept, but for logical reasons, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in here. Um, um, the key article describing it was written by Nieberg and colleagues uh, in 2012, uh, Memory Aging and Brain Maintenance. Their basic idea is that 
particularly with regards to normal aging, that there are individual differences in the manifestation of age-related brain changes in pathology. And those individual differences really account for some people showing more or less age-related cognitive decline. So it's not about reserve against the brain changes in pathology, but really individual differences in developing those changes. So relative lack of brain changes in pathology is the biggest contributor to heterogeneity of cognitive aging, according to them. Uh, and interestingly, um, the same kinds of um, genetic, environmental, and lifestyle choices um, that are um, associated with reserve, cognitive reserve, which I'll get to, can also play a role in maintaining brain integrity and cognitive performance. I think brain maintenance is a very important concept. At any point in time, the degree of brain maintenance would result in a specific level of brain reserve. And um, uh, it, it, it's just a, a key concept to keep in mind. Um, here's some early evidence from um, uh, your group. Um, here, um, the hippocampal volume was measured at two periods of time, and everyone got this life experiences questionnaire. Um, and uh, the key finding was that over five years, um, uh, loss of hippocampal size was less in people with higher LEQ than lower LEQ, suggesting that there was something about life exposures that allow people to maintain their brain, maintain their hippocampus at the same uh, level. Uh, Here's um, uh, something um, even more um, uh, intriguing. Um, this is Lando et al. with uh, Phil, Phil Jagist. They were studying um, healthy elderly people uh, with cognitive tasks and fMRI, uh, but they also gave them at that time PIB, which is a um, pet marker for amyloid. Uh, and uh, they had also given people this Wilson scale, which looks at cognitively stimulating activity. And um, at least for cognitively stimulating activity uh, during middle age, uh, they found this inverse relationship between the amount of activity people were engaged in and their uh, buildup of plaque. Um, so that the people who engaged in the least activities had the most plaque, the people who engaged in the most activities had the least plaque. So uh, this um, extends the idea of brain maintenance to not just um, the kinds of things that I would usually think about brain volume or cortical thickness, but perhaps to the development of pathology law uh, uh, altogether. And, and that's really a very intriguing concept that's um, getting more play as, as time goes on. Okay, um, cognitive reserve um, is the next concept to, to talk about briefly. So um, I'll start with this um, um, figure from an article by Sats uh, very early on. Sats really didn't um, promulgate this concept of brain reserve. He was thinking of the idea of brain reserve capacity and of thresholds. And so he posed this situation where uh, one patient has greater brain reserve capacity than the other. Uh, they both get the same size lesion to the brain, but because this person has less brain reserve capacity, um, this lesion pushes them below some functional impairment cutoff, so they, they show impairment. And um, to me, that really exemplified the concept of brain reserve. And I call it a, a passive model in that we're not talking about what the intact brain does to cope with the lesion. We're just saying that if someone has a lesion that brings them below threshold, uh, they're going to show deficit. Um, for Sats, it was much more complex than that. He just didn't believe in brain reserve. He believed in um, this uh, applying perhaps to education and other things as well but I think it's illustrative. So when I started thinking about the idea of cognitive reserve, uh, I made a parallel graph where now we have two people with the same amount of brain reserve capacity. Um, um, they, and, and now the person uh, um, with higher brain reserve capacity can tolerate, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, even though they have the same brain reserve capacity, one person can tolerate a much larger lesion than the other uh, before they should start to show functional impairment. Uh, and here, what we're talking about is an active model where this person's brain somehow can deal with that lesion, a larger lesion, and maintain function, uh, whereas this person's brain uh, uh, starts to um, give way 
uh, with a smaller lesion. So it's an active process that can differ from person to person. Um, how did this concept of cognitive reserve develop? Well, there were a couple of key early papers. Uh, this is really my very first paper where I talk about cognitive reserve, uh, although I don't think I mentioned um, the, the name cognitive reserve in this paper. Uh, thinking about that graph that I just showed you, I imagine that if some people can withstand more Alzheimer's pathology than others, that, and let's say something like education or, um, has something to do with that, that if we looked at people post-mortem uh, and we had two patients who die, uh, one with high education and one with low education, but they both looked the same clinically at the point of death, we might imagine that there is more plaques and tangles in the person with higher education. In other words, even though they look the same clinically, the person with higher, quote, reserve could, uh, a accommodate more pathology. Now, we didn't have autopsy materially in those days, but we did have um, 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 imaging, functional brain imaging, um, like um, FTG PET. This is actually xenon. Um, and although I didn't, and, and we knew that the, there's a, a certain loss in, in, in cerebral blood, uh, cerebral um, blood flow, um, even um, that associated with AD pathology, which started out temporal parietally uh, and then moved frontally later in the disease. And we knew that was related to, to pathology. Today, the term that I would use for it that is being used is neurodegeneration. Uh, where you might have tau and um, amyloid buildup, um, maybe other pathologies that it leads to neurodegeneration as measured by PET, uh, which then leads to the cognitive um, functions. So here we have um, 20, 20, and 20 patients with Alzheimer's disease matched for severity above high school education, high school graduates below high school. And you can see that as you move up to higher and higher education, we're seeing more depletion of uptake, particularly in the temporal parietal area, suggesting that controlling for disease severity, these people with higher education really have more um, um, neurodegeneration, more um, pathologic changes. And I, I like to show this pa uh, paper, first of all, because I, I was so thrilled with it. I, I'm, I'm always um, um, presenting it in any presentation, but also because I think it incorporates the three key components for studying cognitive reserve. In reserve, we want a measure of brain change or pathology. We want a clinical outcome of that pathology and then a moderator of that relationship. So something is moderating the effect of uh, these brain changes on the clinical outcome. Here's the first um, epidemiologic study that I was involved with. We were following people in um, North Manhattan again. And basically what we did is we started people with people who were cognitively intact, followed them over time to look to see um, whether education, occupation, or occupation uh, were associated with differential risk of uh, becoming demented. Uh, so here, um, low versus high education, cut at age eight, the people with lower education were twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease over the follow-up period. With regard to occupational attainment, the same thing, the people with lower occupational attainment were twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease over the uh, follow-up period. And then if we combine the two, the people with high education and high occupational attainment was sort of the reference, uh, those with low one or low the other had intermediate risk and the people with both low educational and occupational attainment were the most likely to get demented. And um, our explanation for that was a, a cognitive reserve explanation, not a brain maintenance explanation. We felt that what's going on is that the Alzheimer's pathology is developing similarly uh, in people with high and low education or high and low occupation, but that um, the people with higher educational uh, attainment or higher occupational attainment could cope with that pathology better, uh, thus putting off the time when they start to um, become demented, start to develop cognitive problems. Uh, here's one of the earliest uh, meta-analyses of that, again, from uh, your group. Um, and I, it's probably hard for you to see this, but here's a whole set of incident studies used looking at education, a bunch with occupation, a few with pre-morbid IQ, and a few with leisure activities. 
And you can see, here's the first four studies that came out. Here's the one that I just showed you. There had been one positive study and two negative studies. Anywhere where the confidence intervals cross uh, one, uh, we don't have a significant protective effect. But you see the great majority of them do show this protective effect. Uh, and I have to say that you know uh, I, I presented these findings as a poster in a neurology meeting. And my friends came over to snicker. Uh, they thought it was something like crystals. Um, you know, um, how can something like education help people um, withstand um, these severe disease pathologies? Um, and it didn't help that the early evidence was mixed. But uh, later on, um, I think there were um, some some technical issues with some of these studies. But later on, consistently, relatively consistently, people were finding. The other thing that we noted uh, pretty early is um, um, what happens to people uh, who have Alzheimer's disease already. Uh, and uh, in short, what we found is that the people with higher education uh, or higher reserve in general, once they develop AD, progress more rapidly. And here's the uh, way that we um, try to explain that. So here you have advancing Alzheimer's uh, pathology, neuropathology. Uh, here you have, let's say, performance on a memory test. Um, if you believe what I'm saying so far, uh, the people with lower reserve will start to be affected by this pathology earlier and start to decline, whereas the people with higher reserve are affected later. Uh, now, the key assumption that we make here is this, this sort of common endpoint, which I think is really valid. We all know that Alzheimer's is a horrible disease uh, once the pathology takes over, no matter how brilliant you are, you reach a point where you can't talk, you can't function, eventually you can't walk. So everyone reaches that same endpoint. So given those assumptions, the people with higher reserve, once they start to show these cognitive problems, actually progress more rapidly. And here we reported this um, uh, here using a, a memory test, the selective reminding test, uh, following people over time. And we show that the people with um, higher education, uh, these are people matched for AD at, at, at baseline, showed more rapid decline uh, than the people with lower um, 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 education. And that's been replicated numerous times. Then here's a, an early paper on um, the idea of cognitive reserve in uh, normal aging. Um, so this is um, a paper by uh, Jen Manley, who was my postdoc at the time. Again, we're using uh, recall. Uh, instead of education, uh, she used literacy. This was one of her um, very important insights early on is that years of education don't really uh, consistently capture how much benefit people got, whereas literacy is probably a better measure. And what Jen found in this study is that the people with higher literacy showed a lower, these are normal, uh, cognitively normal elders, uh, showed less of a rapid decline, a lower rate of decline, uh, over time in um, memory than the people uh, with lower literacy. Now, I have to say that that has been um, uh, um, not found all at the time. So there's a bunch of studies looking at education. Um, we found it and replicated it in North Manhattan, but many other large studies have not. Um, so there's sort of um, a mixed story. I think part of it is the variable education or literacy might not be the best. There are probably other variables where you can see it better. So I like to show a little new data. I've showed you all this old data. Here's a paper that's in um, archive, but you know, is in, in, um, in um, uh, under review uh, in another journal. Uh, and it's from a new longitudinal, relatively new longitudinal study that I have where we give people um, tests of perceptual speed, episodic memory, uh, fluid reasoning, and vocabulary. And we end up giving them six of each, three in the scanner and three without. So what we can do is, um, let's say uh, here for memory, we have six memory tests. Uh, we can create a latent variable that summarizes their performance at baseline, uh, and then a follow-up. Uh, and then we can look at change in um, cognition over five years. Uh, we have about um, 250 people in here. Uh, important for you to understand is that the age range is from 20 to 80. So the median age is 60, but we have people from 20 to 80 very carefully distributed. Um, and here's what we see in terms of five-year change. Um, reasoning, processing speed, and memory all decline with aging. 
Um, there's sort of a point of inflection for each uh, where they start to decline even more rapidly. You, you see it here for memory, here for speed, and here for reasoning. Interestingly, vocabulary increases over time. And, and that makes a lot of sense. Vocabulary is sort of um, semantic knowledge and probably what happens is that we acquire it over time. Uh, and that's why very often when you see these cross-sectional studies, you'll find that vocabulary knowledge is higher in the uh, older people. Uh, it could be a cohort effect, it, it, it could be a recruitment bias, but I think it's really true. Uh, and these longitudinal data support that. Um, this um, um, shows um, the decline. Here we have the change from baseline to follow-up uh, as a function of age. And what we're seeing is that the for, for reasoning, memory, and speed, the older you are, the greater the five-year decline. So the decline does um, increase uh, in rapidity with age. Vocabulary is interesting. Note that um, really for the younger people, uh, there's an uh, overall a mean increase. And as you get older, uh, you have less of a change and maybe a, a small change as you uh, get very, quite old into the 80s. Um, and then uh, here's where I wanted to get to. Um, now we have estimated IQ here. So again, we have um, change in cognition over time and we have estimated IQ. And what we found here is that for a reasoning and for memory, uh, higher IQ at baseline was associated with less five-year change. We don't see that for processing speed, but we do see it for um, a memory and for reasoning. We didn't, of course, do it for vocabulary because our measures of, uh, of IQ and our measures of vocabulary really are on top of one another. And important to say, one important thing, so we could say, oh, that could be evidence of cognitive reserve, that people with higher IQ are showing less change over five years in reasoning and memory. But it also could be brain maintenance. Uh, it could be that they are maintaining their brain better. It's not that they are uh, dealing with the same age-related changes, uh, uh, but some are dealing with them better than others. It could be that they're just not showing as much change. So what we did is we uh, looked at five-year changes in brain structure measures and showed that they were really similar across uh, the IQ levels. Uh, and really it was that the people with higher IQ were coping with those age-related changes better. So, uh, uh, I think it's nice evidence for the idea that even in normal aging, we can see the impact of cognitive reserve. Uh, here's another article um, uh, using the same data, but looking at leisure activities. So um, uh, an another proxy for um, the kinds of activities that might promote cognitive reserve. And here again, for um, a reasoning, speed, memory, and vocabulary, we see that um, um, higher engagement in leisure activities is associated with less change over time. So I was convinced at some point that the idea that cognitive reserve existed and the question was where to go from there. So a lot of what I've done over the years is, is try to understand what the neural implementation of cognitive reserve is. In other words, how does it work in the brain? What is really going on there? And because of the time where I was first asking that question, I was really strongly influenced, influenced to use imaging to do it. Um, it uh, functional imaging was really just uh, beginning first with xenon and with um, um, fast water PET and then eventually with uh, fMRI. So I would, you might say, seduced into uh, doing um, brain imaging studies to try to understand how reserve is implemented. And early on, uh, these are not the best names, neural reserve and neural compensation, especially because reserve is a cognitive reserve. But the idea is what are the neural implementations of reserve? And I thought it, would, it might be good to divide things into two buckets. Um, one is things that happen even in the normally developing brain. So it's possible that um, there's inter-individual variability and the brain networks or cognitive paradigms that underlie task performance in the healthy brain. So some people do tasks differently than others. Um, some people have, um, you know, I, I think the easiest way to uh, think about it is uh, with math. Um, um, I remember um, when my daughter was in second grade, she was like trying to do seven plus six uh, and remember that that's 13. And I said, oh, why don't you do seven plus three plus three? She looked at me sort of funny 
Uh, I don't think it was too helpful to her. But my point is that when it comes to math problems, um, uh, we can look at them and we, you know, some people can have a more flexible approach to uh, them. Um, other concepts are efficiency or capacity, the networks underlying um, various um, cognitive functions can um, um, compensate for, can deal with more load uh, 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 and, and, and still function. So these are all things that could be there and, and um, people that are just aging normally, but when the brain is challenged, um, they might allow people to cope better with brain damage. So individuals with greater neural reserve might be more capable of coping with disruption imposed by age-related changes in pathology. And then another concept that was uh, suggested really early on is this idea of compensation, where people perhaps recruit new or different networks uh, than they normally would in order to cope with brain changes. Um, so I, I wanted to reserve the term compensation for that inter-individual ability, variability, and the ability to compensate for brain pathology's disruption of standard networks by using networks not normally used with intact brains. Now there's a lot, I'll get down to um, nosology later. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that people use that word compensation. So and those are sort of the ideas that uh, I thought about in, in terms of the neural implementation of cognitive reserve. The kind of studies that I'm doing to investigate that are um, fMRI studies where we have young and old people uh, we measure everything about their brains that we can. Um, we um, uh, give them cognitive tasks in the scanner and out of the scanner. And we have a lot of cognitive reserve proxies, things that might promote reserve, like we talked about education or occupation, null attainment, or late life leisure activities, uh, social uh, exposures, et cetera. And we would hope that, and to some degree, as I suggested, that these measures of cognitive reserve might moderate between the degree of brain change and the degree of cognitive change. Uh, and then we give two tasks in the scanner, a working memory task and an executive function task. And our hope is by looking at differences in how these people, people do these tasks, we might get inklings of the differences in, in, in the processing of tasks that allow people to cope with brain changes better. Um, Here's a summary of um, uh, some initial studies that we did. Um, we had a measure of age-related pathology, um, it was atrophy. Um, we had task performance uh, on a working memory task. And when we looked in the brain, we saw that uh, as age-related pathology, with fMRI, we looked in the brain, uh, we found that as age-related pathology increased, uh, the networks, the, the areas involved in this working memory study um, showed less efficiency. In other words, uh, you had to ramp them up even more in order to do the task. Uh, uh, and, and, and then at some point, um, people started to use another uh, compensating network, compensatory network, which was really associated with poorer performance, but still allowed people to do the work. And that these uh, changes in efficiency and the move to compensation were related to task performance. And then we uh, looked at uh, measured CR, by measured, I mean using proxies like IQ. And we found that people with higher IQ, let's say, had higher efficiency, uh, were less likely to compensate. And because of that, um, they uh, still did the task better uh, so they could cope with more age-related pathology uh, than people with lower research. So in a nutshell, that's a very quick summary of the kind of games we're trying to play, understand how reserve is implemented. And I could say that what we're really talking about in that explanation is task-related neural activity. In other words, what are they doing in that particular task? And, and the kinds of phenomenon and differential activation really has to do with the nature of uh, the areas that are called on to do that task. But we saw something else is that no matter what we saw in terms of task-related activation, the people with higher cognitive reserve just typically did better on tasks. So whether they had uh, high efficiency, low efficiency, they're compensating or not, uh, the people with higher reserve still did better. Uh, and that made me think of sort of task invariant. Can we find task invariant activation, something that perhaps is utilized in whatever task people uh, do uh, that allows them to do better. Um, so, um, we wrote an earlier paper than this one in 2018, but I like this one better because it's, it's, it's just more comprehensive. So here, 
Um, I told you before, we have 12 tasks that we give in the scanner, um, three each from four abilities. So we said, can we look at activation while people are doing 12 different tasks and find a pattern of activity of activation that's common across those 12 tasks and uh, its expression, the expression of that network correlates with um, um, uh, cognitive reserve proxies like IQ and education. So can we find in a pattern of cognitive reserve related brain activity? It's common and, and expressed in 12 different tasks with varying processing demands. And then we can look at that network in a totally different activation task, see if that network is still activated there and whether it, its activation in a totally different task correlates with IQ. And then the last test is, can we show that the utilization of that network moderates the relationship between structural brain measures and task performance? And that's the cognitive reserve test, as I've said a few times now. So we posit there, there are brain changes that lead to cognitive changes and the cognitive reserve helps moderate. So does, can we find all of that? And I wouldn't be showing you this unless we did. So here is um, a set of brain areas uh, that were involved in this network. We look at the covarying activation of those areas. Uh, um, we did show that expression of this network during performance in a different fMRI activation task correlated with IQ. And then here's the moderation. So here we have cortical thickness. Here we have fluid reasoning. And you can see as in general, as thickness gets less and less, performance on fluid reasoning is poorer. The red highlights people with higher expression of this task invariant network and black with lower. And you can see that as thickness is diminished, the people that are expressing this network do better on fluid reasoning than the people who are not. So it's a parting reserve. So that's a task invariant network. Uh, and then we tried to do the same thing with resting bold where we um, identified a connectome, uh, a resting bold pattern that was associated with IQ um, and um, we looked for, here we again have mean thickness, um, this connectome score uh, 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 on global cognition, and we found um, um, a um, protective effect um, uh, of the IQ connectome score on cognition, uh, on global cognition. Um, uh, we didn't find an interaction term, but we found that over and above mean thickness, this IQ score uh, was protective both in uh, the derivation sample of this connectome and then in the follow-up. But, you know, I'm a, also a neuropsychologist and to some degree a cognitive psychologist. So over the years, I've always thought, well, maybe there's other ways that we could capture reserve that have, um, that, that, that don't require imaging, that don't require fMRI. And um, here's a paper that again, is just under submission. Uh, this was uh, this Dan Baruli's uh, dissertation. Uh, uh, and what we wanted to get at was, can we look at this concept of flexibility of solution strategy. Uh, and the way that we went about doing it was using matrix reasoning. So I think most of you should be familiar with matrix reasoning. Um, this one's easier. You have nine panels, the sections, one is missing, and then you have to use some logic in order to figure out which of these um, um, choices is the correct choice. Um, and what's interesting about matrix reasoning is that uh, you can create matrices that really require different strategies. So the strategy here is clearly visuospatial. Um, you can look at the shading and you can look at the orientation. Uh, you can see how these, and, and basically using those visuospatial cues, select the uh, correct, um, correct choice. Other matrices can be designed so that they're really logical analytic. So here's an and strategy, this plus this equals this right? Um, um, uh, this, um, yeah, this plus this equals this. Uh, and then you have um, this one where you have to figure it out. So it's a totally different kind of strategy. So what we said is this is pretty simplistic. Let's use um, these kinds of, um, of um, matrix reasoning tasks uh, in a set switching uh, protocol where we have a set of blocks and in two blocks, they just do one type or the other, but in two, they have to uh, switch back and forth. 
between um, these two strategies. Um, so um, it's very simplistic. We're talking about flexibility. So in those switch blocks, people have to move from a logical uh, task sometimes to um, a um, um, to a visual task, back to a logical task, and we can look at the uh, kinds of costs that uh, uh, are um, on performance, either reaction time or accuracy or both, that are engaged in flexibility and, and, and having to switch back and forth between the strategies. And again, our test of whether that's reservy is whether it moderates. So um, uh, here for memory, we found that performance on this uh, switching task using a bin score, a, a score that, sorry, this is bin, but a bin score that um, summarizes both um, RT and re reaction time and uh, accuracy costs. So here, um, the performance on this task moderated the relationship between uh, cortical thickness and memory. Uh, and for uh, reasoning and for global cognition, it didn't moderate, but it contributed, the, the performance on the task contributed to better performance after controlling for cortical thickness. So we think it's sort of an interesting um, um, way of beginning to understand the neural implementation of cognitive research uh, um, using a cognitive task. So let me close out by talking briefly about the uh, clinical implications of cognitive reserve. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with these curves that, that Cliff Jack has been publishing. This was um, uh, in 2013, he published a version that had an interesting addition to it. So as you know, he has these measures of a beta that are developing, either CSF or um, um, amyloid PET. Later you have uptake of tau. Um, Later, you see this neurodegeneration that I'm talking about with MRI or FDG PET. And then finally, the green is cognitive impairment. And it used to be one line, but at some point, he divided out that cognitive important impairment to high risk and low risk. Uh, so that there's really a band. Uh, so across here, some people can tolerate more of all of those brain changes than others uh, before they um, develop um, AD where some have much higher risk. And basically what he's summarizing there is the effect of cognitive reserve. And, and he and I have discussed that. So really cognitive reserve really uh, is a real phenomenon that influences when people develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, it makes you think that an optimal evaluation of age-related change or Alzheimer's disease could include measures of pathology age-related brain changes, the various measures of, of tau and amyloid and neurodegeneration, and cognitive reserve. And, and the implications of those pathologic changes would vary as a function of cognitive reserve. And it's really important to keep that in mind for early diagnosis and characterization. Um, so you can have people with high reserve that will um, have brain changes. Let's say they'll be amyloid positive on PET. Uh, but not demented yet, whereas others with lower reserve won't. Prognosis, because we, we've seen that people with higher cognitive reserve, once they develop the disease, have more rapid decline, measuring progression. And I think it's really important for um, assessing interventions, uh, um, like drug trials, where drug trials rely on differential uh, decline, rates of decline on cognitive tasks. Um, no one's thinking about curing the disease. They're thinking about uh, delaying the decline in the disease. And without taking cognitive reserve into account, and if you don't have a good distribution of reserve, you might see effects that are, you might have a real confound. So I think it's important there. Um, when you think about reserve in the real world, either as a true intervention or in talking about things that people can do to uh, age more successfully, I think what we could think of both brain maintenance and cognitive reserve, where brain maintenance would be aimed at maintaining the brain, um, both age-related and Alzheimer's pathology and other pathologies as well. And cognitive reserve would be aimed at um, doing better in the face of these age-related brain changes. And both are happening at the same time. These are really very complementary concepts. So what kind of things have people looked at? Well, I, I, I like to show this. Um, this is an um, early uh, paper by Marcus Richards. Um, uh, where in, in, you know he's he's involved with a longitudinal study where he's had people uh, follow since they were born, 
So he has all of this information, uh, parental SES, uh, cognition at eight years, education by 26 years, occupation by 43 years. Later, he has leisure activity. And what Marcus is showing uh, in this paper is that cognition, education, and occupation each contribute differentially to cognitive performance at age 53. You might think that really all that happens is people have a higher IQ, so they have a higher education, so they get better jobs. But what Marcus is showing is that each one is contributing independently. And um, later on, he's shown another that there's other things that go on later in life. Um, uh, let's say uh, social networks, um, exercise, et cetera, that are influence, influential. So it, it makes two points. One is that um, uh, cognitive reserve can be impacted in multiple ways at different points over the lifetime. There's things that people can do later in life to impart reserve. And then finally, it's probably not good to have a summary score for reserve because what we have is a formative kind of a model. Um, and, and Rich Jones wrote a very nice paper on this where each one of these cognition, education, and occupation in this case are contributing separate amounts towards cognitive reserve. And if you try to create what's common to them, you're losing the differential benefits that they create. Um, here's a nice paper from my uh, Nick Scarmaeus, who worked with me for many years. Now he's back in Greece, where he looked at physical activity and Mediterranean diet. And he showed that people who had high physical activity and adhered to the uh, Mediterranean diet um, did much better in terms of incident Alzheimer's disease than people who did neither. Um, and then um, we constantly or regularly get these reviews of potentially modifiable risk factors for dementia. Here you see education, hypertension, in other words, heart healthy, um, uh, hearing turns out to be very important, um, depression, social isolation, uh, physical inactivity. Uh, all of these things are things that um, might impact both uh, brain maintenance and cognitive. Finally, I just very briefly mentioned the issue of, of um, nosology um, terms that people use. So um, as part of this reserve and resilience protective factors, PIA, these are the professional interest associations that are um, that, that, that meet yearly at the uh, annual Alzheimer's disease conference, conference. 31 of us came up with a white paper that defined brain reserve, brain maintenance, and cognitive reserve with research guidelines and operational definitions. Subsequently, the NIA, the National Institute of Aging, which funds most of our research, um, we had a um, cognitive, a brain aging meeting um, uh, conference um, focusing on these re reserve and resilience. And they, um, um, project officers noted that there was really a lot of different definitions and different ways of, um, of con 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 conceiving of reserve and resilience, uh, different uh, terms people use. So they um, uh, put out a request for applications for what they call this collaboratory. And so we're entering the third year. Um, one aim is to organize cross-discipline net workshops. We've had two of them, work groups that access, assess key programmatic issues, uh, develop data information exchange platforms, support pilot studies. Um, and But the key issue is to develop definitions and research guidelines uh, that even if people that, that, that people can use as a reference so that we can speak the same language. Um, you can go to reserveandresilience.com to see the two, um, the two um, meetings that we've had so far. We're a few months away from our third meeting, which will be uh, at the end of September. And we are uh, um, um, almost there with a framework across both human and non-human researchers of sort of a a consensus guideline for brain reserve, brain maintenance, and cognitive reserve uh, that can serve as touchstones for people in their research. So just to sum up, I think epidemiologic and imaging evidence support this concept of reserve. It's important to recall that it's malleable and it can be influenced by aspects of experience in every stage of life. I've tried to talk about two forms of reserve, brain reserve, which is sort of passive, but is supported by this brain maintenance process, and cognitive reserve, which I call active, 
The concept of cognitive reserve is applicable to any condition that impacts on brain function at any age. So I've talked mainly about cognitive aging and Alzheimer's, but it's been applied to multiple sclerosis, it's applied to psychiatric illnesses and many other diseases. Really, we need life course studies in order to really um, identify experiences that contribute to reserve. I've tried to show you how imaging studies can clarify its neural implementation. And I, I think across the field, accepted consistent definitions for these concepts will be help, helpful. Even if people want to use different terms, if they use um, some accepted definitions as a touchstone, I think it will be helpful in communicating. And then the key thing is that influencing reserve and brain maintenance may delay or reverse the effects of aging or brain pathology. That's the thing that we hope for. Um, um, so that um, our, our, our work on brain maintenance, on cognitive reserve, will really give us um, insight into um, how, how helping people um, do better with aging and, and in case of dementia. So I'll be glad to uh, talk with you uh, in the Q&A period. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Stern. That was a wonderful overview. We have a few questions coming. So maybe this is the opportunity to answer those questions. Uh, I think the, the first thing perhaps um, I can uh, maybe um, bring you back to before we address these questions is, uh, I mean, you already have uh, sp spoken to the terminology that is being used currently. And we have these concepts of brain maintenance, brain resilience. Uh, now, what, what do you think are uh, in this uh, collaboratory that you have now, which are the terms that are going forward, would you say? So I think partly because of my influence, the terms that we ended up working with are cognitive reserve and brain maintenance. There was a lot of controversy about the term brain reserve, and we were going to leave it out because some people had a very difficult time with it, but then others asked to, to keep it in. But I think the bottom, the thing that really I hope will be useful is not that we've used those terms, but for each, we've supplied an operational definition um, so that, it, you know, we say, look, if you're going to, as I've tried to make clear in this talk, if you're going to look at something like cognitive reserve uh, and you have a brain change that causes a cognitive change and you have something that influences that in some way or moderates, we'll call that cognitive reserve. You want to call that resilience. You want to call that um, whatever compensation. Um, that's okay, as long as we're playing the same game and we can point to these operational definitions. And so we've tried to make those definitions very clear. And the same thing for brain maintenance, basically something that influences the maintenance of the brain. And, and we went even further, we gave out um, 12 uh, pilot studies um, to get as exemplars. Um, uh, and, and so part of this final, um, um, framework, as we're calling it, will really just couch these definitions very carefully and give a bunch of examples about how people ask these questions. So I think if someone wants to use some other form or another term, as long as they keep those components in mind that are key for different types of research, we'll be able to triangulate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, there's a lot of interest uh, in the audience uh, questions on uh, how does one influence cognitive reserve? Uh, so does it happen to be, firstly, can you improve upon cognitive reserve and can you improve upon it at any stage of life? Right, right. So I, I think you can. I, I think the epidemiology suggests that for sure there, there are certainly things that happen very early in life that are crucial. Um, some interaction between IQ and education and the type of education. And there, you know, we're learning more and more about many other environmental influences um, that influence how well people uh, do in school and um, occupational uh, experiences turn out to be very important. But yeah, there's, there's a whole set of other activities um, from exercise to diet adherence to um, later in life engagement in leisure activities, social networks, and probably many other things that we just don't know how to measure that continue to influence reserve. Um, so I think that 
throughout the lifespan um, reserve can be imparted. Um, how to create a study that does that? Um, you know, you could see, you know, like more lately, there's the, the finger study, um, uh, which tries, I think, to do something like that, where they give people um, dietary guidelines that might promote brain maintenance. But then at the same time, they're giving them some kind of a, a, a video game that, that might um, impart more um, flexibility and solution strategy. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the key for each person is to figure out the activities that they would be happy with, not force themselves to juggle or to learn how to play the violin, but pursue things that they would enjoy, but to pursue the you know, more things to do, you know, especially in older age. Oh, okay. So can I, as a follow-up on that, can I ask you, what would you recommend? Say a 60-year-old comes to you yeah. and says, look, I'm worried about my brain health. I want to avert dementia. What should I do? So what is your recommendation? Well, I, I try to be very careful about, yeah. but I think, I think there's things we know we can say. Heart healthy. Uh, we know that's very important, be it a Mediterranean diet or heart healthy diet. Exercise, very clear, very clear evidence. Um, and then just engagement in activities, be it work, which can create all kinds of stimulation, uh, social engagement of various sorts, hobbies. Um, it doesn't have to be um, studying nuclear physics. Uh, but these different forms of engagement, I think, are, are really crucial and just very important. Uh, and, you know, and, and I think people can be guided, as I said before, guided by their interests. Um, it doesn't yeah. have to be go to play Sudoku, you know, people can be guided by their interests. I think those are fair. They're the kind of things your mother would tell you. Uh, eat healthy, <laughs> stay busy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but what, uh, I mean, there's few things that people recommend, say, okay, to go back to university, for example, or the late age university, uh, or uh, study a new language, or uh, things yeah. like that, really, or learn dancing or something like that. Is there any particular activity to, that you recommend? Or I, yeah, I, I think they're all good, but yeah. I, I really feel like people should follow what interests them. Um, you know, some people just won't take to going to take classes, but really would like to do Tai Chi or to um, uh, just walk with friends or um, socialize to a greater degree. So I, I don't think there's one magic bullet, but I do think that all of those things, you know, like I personally, um, you know, I guess I get enough cognitive stimulation, I hope from <laughs> my research. Uh, but you know, I was a person who could never exercise. I was never an exerciser, even though I, when I was very well convinced. So you know, finally I got into the habit of you know my my office is on the uh, 19th floor, so I, I walk up to my office once a day, uh, and then I wrote a grant. I wrote a grant about Tai Chi, which includes some some physical motion, but also has that um, uh, meditation component to it. Uh, so uh, I wrote a grant about Tai Chi, and then I convinced myself that's something to do. But those are things that attracted me. I think other people would find a combination. And then trying to eat healthy uh, is another part of it. Yeah, so I think everyone has to find their combination. So one, one of the questions that comes up often is uh, computerized uh, activities, say com uh, computerized cognitive challenges or in video games that people are using these days as well. What do you think of that? I think it's um, it's a complex question. Um, uh, I think video game. There, there's a lot of interesting research suggesting that the right kinds of video games um, could be beneficial. Um, but there's also evidence that just practicing how to do some specific tasks over and over might not yield what we call transfer of training. So you might get better at the task that the video game is teaching you, um, but that it might not really transfer to your day-to-day -day activities. So I think the to rely on a commercial brain game, I don't think is optimal. Although I have to say there are some one of the one 
one of the commercial games now incorporates a task that did show some effectiveness in one trial. Uh, but I, I think if you enjoy those, great. But I, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, um, break break the bank on it. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't want to just rely on some kind of commercial game. Okay. Yeah. So people are also interested in uh, cultural differences in this. Have you uh, looked at any minority populations to see whether there are any differences? That's it. Yeah. So I mean, this is. This is something that's really very important um, because uh, our our life experiences can be very much influenced by cultural differences, ethnic differences, discriminate. You know, the United States. I mean, uh, you know, this is one of the big issues. So, New York City. When I we first started doing uh, research, uh, we had a large um, um, a black population, uh, but we had people with two types of histories of education, those who were educated in New York where everyone got the same education, there might've been some level of discrimination in getting into the better schools. And then we had people from the South who were um, in these segregated schools where the quality of the education was much more poor. And that's just a small example. Uh, you know, so I think there's a lot of emphasis, emphasis now on just sort of the pervasiveness, whether it be the neighborhood you live in, the exposure to um, pollution, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I think these things will, will th there's enough interest that I think that there's gonna be these complex interactions between uh, um, culture, uh, discrimination, uh, learning. But I think the general principles that, that I'm talking about still apply. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of work on multilingual people as well, really, as bilingual, multilingual versus monolingual. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. So the you know that's a very interesting area. Um, bilingualism is really complicated because there's all kinds of bilingualism. Um, yeah. um, there's two languages that are close to each other versus languages that are very separate. Do you? actively engage in both languages or you just know one or the other? Did you, have you used them since birth or did you learn them later in life? Uh, and this makes things very complex. Um, uh, you know, I think there are some good studies. I mean, the better studies, um, some of the early studies I didn't feel were too powerful because they were not incident studies that started with people without dementia. They were look back studies where doctors estimated how long people had Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then tried to show that people who are bilingual did better. But I, I think there is uh, some evidence for bilingualism. Um, you know, the, the idea is that somehow um, that switching uh, is, um, is important and might be good. Um, would I advise someone to go and learn a second language uh, as a way to impart reserve? Yeah, if, if they're interested, I wouldn't force themselves or someone to do it. Uh, but yeah, I think if someone would find that interesting, I think it might be something that would be stimulating. Yeah. It's an interesting point here uh, from Jill Floyd, actually. She cites the uh, story of her mother who had eclampsia at the age of 39 and found on MRI later to have an extensive non-dominant hemispheric cerebrovascular damage, and then went on to study art at age 50 and doing study later in life. So question is, okay, someone after say brain trauma or a lesion like that, uh, how, what role does um, cognitive activity play in rehabilitation or recovery? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm less expert in that. Yeah. My, you know, it, it's sort of uh, the aging and Alzheimer's disease are, are interesting in, or, 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 or similar in that they're both sort of slow, more general processes that happen over time. Whereas um, a, a focal stroke really does direct damage to some area of the brain that's important. Uh, but I think the general principles are similar in that if you're fortunate enough, um, you know, there might be things that cannot be recovered specific brain areas, but the idea of flexibility, of finding different ways to solve problems of, of, of uh, stimulation, I think still, still play a role. 
Yeah, the, there, there are one or two questions which perhaps uh, can be handled offline, uh, especially from Frini Her Karyanidis, who actually basically has a very specific question in relation to a model. Maybe uh, you can respond to her at um, sure. some stage later. She's also from Newcastle, where Peter Schofield works. So uh -huh. uh, I think you, I don't know whether you met her. Um, and um, yeah, there's a question here about types of occupation uh, and in and also in terms of the interaction i first bring in the interact physical activity say right. so you have a laborer who's physically active as opposed to someone who's a desk right. worker, and then right. so, yeah. That. Yeah, yeah. so that's very interesting i mean occupation is very interesting um when we first started we used something called the dictionary of occupational titles now they are something online at least in the states called o star net o asterisk net uh and it's very interesting what they've done they've tried to examine multiple multiple types of occupations and characterize them in this o star net you can actually download their or, or just look up their database and they classify occupations across hundreds of different dimensions. Um, a, 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 a simpler one that people have used in the past is data, people, and things, uh, where every job has some um, component of all of those. Uh, in some of studies, we've looked at the physical demands of a job, the, the um, cognitive demands of a job, the social demands. Uh, but, but things can get much more fine cut and it's really quite complex how to characterize op uh, um, occupation. And it changes over time, but clearly there's a lot, you know, uh, just in a very, you know, there's probably a real difference between a job that just requires straight physical activity versus one that requires interpersonal um, 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 activities or um, more cognitive demands. So each of those jobs um, really can um, make a difference. And then it's, it's sort of interesting, the economists have this concept of human capital, yeah. uh, where what they're, bit, what they're talking about really is what are the experiences that allow people to make much more money in life? <laughs> but I, I, in talking to some economists, it turns out that a lot of those concepts map on to the cognitive reserve concepts very closely that there's a set of activities across the lifespan and uh, inputs that really can impart reserve in the same way that they can impart human capital yeah so uh, interesting i think we, we run out of time so i don't think there's uh, scope for many more questions but just wanted to ask you this question that was asked of me some time ago okay that you're looking at say prevention of dementia at a population level or at a, a global level, which is the one thing that you would really tell politicians that they should focus on? <laughs> For one, not, just, maybe, not necessarily one thing, but maybe one or two things, yeah. Given, given what we know now, I think um, uh, focusing on good basic health throughout the lifespan you know, the United States spends a lot at the end of life, but really not, let's say on children. So I think that's the best place to start is with children and the proper care, um, uh, maximizing quality of education and, and uh, social, social intercourse. Uh, I think that's really the place yeah. to start. Yeah. yeah, no, that that was my answer as well. So thank, I think we agree. Good, glad we agree. <laughs> thank you. It's it's been wonderful uh, listening to you uh, this morning for us, and uh, and thank you, thank you again uh, for the wonderful lecture. And hope Great. it was we can a pleasure. Uh, it was a pleasure, and thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, take care. Now. Yeah.